gonna kick this show off fast and furious with uh what i consider my good friend the friendly face i see at construction sites all the time his name is mark fabris he's from vaccine architects he's the one of the principal at vaccine architects he is a certified passive house designer he's been with vaccine since 2010 he's worked on multiple passive house projects and has helped develop the firm's details over the years and is starting a new role overseeing construction and detailing in the firms. It's always great to see Mark on site and running a project. And we're working together on this project of uh, the Brooklyn, House Pass uh, Brooklyn Heights Passive House Project. So the floor is yours, Mark. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Just uh, want to give a quick intro to our project team. As Kevin said, I'm working with uh, Kevin Brennan for, and he's doing all the air sealing and insulation and more. Uh, we got John Miss Mitchell as our passive house consultant on the project. Um, Michael Ingui and myself for the architects and the uh, contractor is uh, Tafara uh, Fine Building. So um, first thing, I just want to give a brief introduction to the project itself. It's basically an existing two-story carriage house in Brooklyn Heights Historic District. Um, the renovation included uh, restoration to the front facade, removal and modification of existing rear addition, excavation uh, to create a new cellar that wasn't previously there. Um, uh, I think I might have said this, a small roof addition. And um, the other sort of interesting part of this is because it was in a, it is in a uh, historic district, we are obligated to keep things sort of minimally visible and historically uh, accurate. Um, as always at Baxing, we, you know, we always employ this sort of systematic approach. This slide sort of dives into that systematic approach um, that we like to employ. Um, and we've been sort of finessing uh, ever since we've started working on Passive House projects over the past you know, 10 or 12 years. Um, just some his historic, um, sort of existing conditions and historic photos. Uh, as you could see uh, in this slide, in this photo here, there was um, quite a bit of uh, work done to the existing, uh, the historic front facade. Um, and this was sort of what it looked like before we got there. And also the rear facade had many lives, um, an existing rear addition that we wound up removing and, um, and uh, some more sort of site context here. So some front elevations, this is our building here. Uh, the building next to it, we worked on about 12 or 15 years ago was not a passive house project, but um, we sort of worked on this with the same contractor that we're working on currently. And it is um, uh, so, you know, sort of tackling uh, a lot of buildings on the same block. Um, just some more <clears throat> sort of uh, front elevations showing what the front facade uh, previously looked like when we got there and then some of the modifications we made, widening an existing arch window and sort of bringing some of the, um, the garage uh, and so forth uh, higher to match the existing uh, front door. And some more rear elevations. Um, uh, I, I mentioned there was a rear addition. You can't really see it in this elevation, but we sort of removed that uh, addition to because it was like a full depth um, building and just to give a small rear yard to this building. Uh, we also were able to use some of the square foot that, footage that we removed to add uh, our roof addition. Um, and this is um, actually a side elevation. So it's a little, this building's a little different than most of our buildings that we're used to working on these row houses where we have true party walls. Um, in this case, we have um, some more exposure on the side facade and it just makes some of that uh, detailing of the passive house uh, stuff a little trickier. Um, the cellar floor plan, basically mostly recreational area, some um, uh, a small powder room and then some mechanical space, which we opted to leave outside of our envelope. So the red line sort of shows how the, uh, the sort of envelope of our house. Um, I think one of the things which Kevin could probably talk to a little bit more is that, um, the, uh, the geometries of our envelope on this particular project are a little bit complicated. You'll see this on a future slide, um, but that just made some of the detailing kind of tricky. 
Um, we also have a some photos of the uh, vapor barrier under the uh, slab. And then this is a photo of sort of what that looks like today. And just some more details in terms of vapor barrier coming all the way up to grade, making those connections um, just really crucial to the passive health uh, air sealing. Um, some more, uh, so then up to the first floor, we have a mostly, you know, living space, kitchen, dining, living room, um, garage outside of our envelope, and a small foyer also outside of our envelope, um, a rendering of what our kitchen will look like and sort of the state of the project today. And up to the second floor, we have um, basically, you know, bedrooms, bathrooms, and laundry room, um, quick rendering, and then again, the stair detail of what the project looks like currently. Um, the, you can see the Intello on the front wall, and then we use this uh, peel and stick uh, on the side walls, which we get, we'll get to that as well. And then just some views of the roof addition. And again, the Intel at the roof, we have a Lamalux skylight up there. Um, and that's pretty much it. So this is basically a diagram. You can see we sort of, where we sort of had to cut out um, the garage out of the envelope and the front mechanical space, um, just sort of showing the complexity of that um, and just how the, that sort of makes some of the detailing of the connections between the uh, insulation and the air barrier uh, a little bit complicated. Um, and as always, a lot of details on this project. Um, I'll run through a few of them. Um, in this case, you know, we had our first floor um, sort of kitchen area that was within the envelope. We have our garage over here outside the envelope and then our cellar below partially also within the envelope. So just making all the connections, um, both insulation and sort of air barrier, uh, again, just super critical to pay attention to those in the detailing um, phase because that's what makes for a successful project. Um, and then another detail at our roof, um, because we're in a we have a historic rear facade. Typically, we can't, you know, raise the cornice, but we had sort of low ceilings, so we sort of employ this detail where we could raise the roof a little bit, slope it, get our outboard insulation. We got our blown-in mineral fiber, uh, uh, blown-in uh, dense pack, and just again some more connection details. And then this was a mock-up that Kevin did on site for us. Um, we were sort of on the fence, do we go with the liquid applied or the peel and stick? Ultimately, I think we decided that, well, we did decide that the peel and stick would work better, a little bit um, less labor intensive, a little bit more on the material side. Um, but because we had these rubble walls that weren't in great shape, um, I think everyone felt safer going with a peel and stick product and taping the seams versus the liquid applied. Um, some more joist pocketing details, you know, just again, just how the sequence, how important the sequence is. You get the liquid applied in the, in the pocket, um, put the, the seal in place. Um, then you sort of put your peel and stick in between, and then you could um, put put in your joist. And then in this case, we also kept a lot of the existing joists, so it was just cleaning up around the edges of the joist getting the peel and stick in place before the subfloor goes in, taping, and then putting the subfloor in so we have something to make the connection through the floors. Um, another sort of typical detail. And another detail where we had steel pocketing into a exterior wall, and we needed a little bit of a structural thermal break. Um, we use the structural foam and uh, and then this sort of got packed in with uh, some more foam non-structural at the end and then bricked in around it. Um, uh, Zola windows uh, being installed, uh, we're working with John Mocus, um, just sort of showing how those uh, got delivered to the site. 
and some of the more unique deep uh, sort of historic uh, front facade windows that Zola was able to make for us a match. And then uh, Kevin and John worked together, I think, on the window install and air sealing around the windows. And um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Nice job, Ben. Thank you. Uh, just for, we're going to hold the questions until the end, right, guys? All right. So who's up next? Thank well, you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. That was fantastic. I really love the combination of the drawings and the renderings and the mock ups in the on site photos. Really cool. I took a lot of screenshots. Thank so thanks for sharing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have the pleasure to talk about our next presenter, who is a doer of many things, architect, designer, artist, printmaker, writer, entrepreneur, ideas person. He was born in Melbourne, Australia, and he's made New York City his home for the past 13 years. And he's worked across three continents for over 23 years in the building and construction industries. His experience traverses scales and sectors, including residential, commercial, civic, institutional, hospitality, retail, and mixed use. So please join me in a resounding welcome to Ben Albury, founder of Amalgam Studios in New York City. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm gonna try to get this slideshow happening. Um, Hopefully this is working. Um, so a couple of disclaimers. Um, I, I, I am an architect, um, first and foremost. I'm not an expert in passive houses at all. Uh, this was my first passive house, my first investigation into um, the passive house world. Um, and I needed some help <laughs> on this project. Um, it is a new build. It's a four bedroom, single family a residence two hours north of uh, New York City. Um, and I worked with 475 out of um, Brooklyn to help with uh, the passive house side of things and also Kramer Silkworth from Bowcraft, um, who's based in the Hudson Valley. And this, uh, this location is um, quite close to the Hudson River. It's actually on the uh, a different river um, called the Roll of Jansen Kill. Um, and it's, oops, sorry, uh, go back a little bit. And the site is on 120 acres. There was nothing there. There was no power, no water, no, no nothing. Um, I really wanted to do an all electric um, home, and that's what this is. Uh, but it's not off grid, um, it is connected. Um, to, to, to the main country road there. Um, incredible, uh, incredible property. It has uh, woodlands, creeks, um, mountains, <laughs> river, and uh, there was this open field that really spoke to me and I sort of convinced the client to put a, um, a barn-like house um, in this location. We did some research uh, into historic barns, Dutch barns, English barns, and we're, we're very much um, influenced by the shape, materiality, uh, and, and the simplicity of the kind of the vernacular barn archetypes um, of uh, of uh, of the area, really, o over time. And so this is um, a very early on sketch, which has it didn't sort of um, uh, didn't sort of change too much from this overall very simple gable shape um, uh, looking uh, north towards the views but also looking south um, for, the, for the solar access so I really wanted something that was um, both um, passive solar but also <laughs> um, passive house uh, so, so use of sunlight use of um, uh, very carefully defined views um, with with glazing, use of uh, sun shading devices as well on, on the south, um, which, which sort of double up as hurricane shutters as well. So this house is um, not for, wasn't designed to be full-time 
home, but it became one during the pandemic. So uh, I'm proud to say that it seems to be working, seems to be working well um, for the for the family at the moment. Um, and uh, so I didn't quite understand that this was more of a technical um, presentation. So I was concentrating on more of the design side of things. Um, so we sort of started with very basic, you know, forms, um, very simple, uh, linear form. Glenn Merkitt is a bit of a, a icon for me. Uh, so I wanted to sort of have a bit of a, an Australian uh, vibe. Um, the client was Australian as well, and but we wanted to do something that was quite sort of European, but also quite relatively sophisticated in terms of the, um, the envelope. And uh, I sort of convinced him to do a uh, high performance um, envelope, and that's where sort of the passive house came in. And another disclaimer this isn't passive house certified, um, but we did design it to passive house uh, standards um, every step of the way. Um, but at the end of the day, the client wasn't um, interested in, in getting this um, certified, uh, which is a bit of a shame, um, but just, just one of those things. Um, so, this is the, the basement, which is basically the semi um, uh, semi submerged in the surrounding landscape uh, we have two decks a large full length south facing deck so inside outside um, uh, um, permeability was really important and access for exterior entertainment and interior um, um, large spaces um, cathedral spaces, which you'll, you'll see later on. Uh, and then a north facing deck with these beautiful views down towards the, the river and and the, the hills and mountains beyond. So really quite a spectacular uh, location and, and site. So I wanted to keep it quite simple. Uh, that gable shape really sort of talked, uh, well, I felt like it was a good shape for passive house, um, but I learned a lot on this um, process, a lot of challenges. Um, and uh, a lot of sort of solutions that had to be um, uh, resolved. So a three level house, basement, ground level, and then a loft level, which was more of a um, open space. I'll pause on the, the sections here. So again, very sort of basic um, cross-sectional shape, um, but some, some of the, um, some of the, the cathedral ceilings feel very different um, as you sort of uh, move through through the house. Um, uh, the access is different. The corridors are different. Um, the, the the ceiling um, materiality changes uh, as well. The staircase breaks up the the house into sort of two public versus private zones. The staircase also has a um, a triple glazed uh, Passive House certified um, skylight. The full the full length of these um, gable forms. Um, I, I think it's the longest Passive House certified triple glazed um, skylight in, in North America. Don't know, um, but it's about 25 feet long. Uh, had, we had to get special cranes in to um, put these uh, put these skylights uh, in in place. Um, so the, yeah, super important sections. Um, uh, and this is a, it was designed with um, SIP construction in mind, um, very simple uh, frame, um, and I'll pause on this thing we're sort of talking technical. Um, so yeah, uh, a, a bent frame, sort of, I would call it a portal frame, um, the bent frame um, at eight feet centers across the entire uh, length of this linear house uh, supporting uh, structure insulated panels um, on, the, on the exterior um, walls as well as the, the roof. So we've got um, R60 for the roof uh, build up um, and then about um, R44 for the, the walls. Um, and 475 helps very much with the um, air seal detail, the, the membranes that we were using. Um, and one unusual feature with this house is that there's a, um, a rain screen, not only on the walls, but on, on the roof as well. And we went through a very long process of choosing what type of wood uh, would go on the, on the outside. So not only is this a passive house, but 
most of the materials you'll see here um, are natural materials uh, and, and what we went with on the out, outside of the house was a material called kevetting, which is from Norway, um, which I hadn't used before, but it's a, it's a soft wood that's been um, you know, processed in a way to make it behave and perform like a, like a hardwood. So that was important to sort of keep um, this sort of clean, modern lines um, of the uh, of the exterior of, the, of this house. So a few construction photos um, that's showing the the bentwood frame go up and I'll, I'll pause on the last uh, image of, of this because it kind of blew my mind. It was very similar similar to the way um, barns were raised uh, in this area you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, the entire frame went up in about four hours um, in one morning. Um, so it's kind of thrilling to sort of see this, uh, the entire framework um, go up much like a barn would have done um, back uh, back in the day with the whole village sort of helping out with hoisting up and pulling up all of these frames which have been prefabricated, pre-finished, um, brought to site and then just lifted into place, hoisted into place from the from the horizontal to the, to the vertical. And so it was, um, Quite a thrill to sort of see this go up so quickly and then um also which was kind of thrilling was to sort of see the um the sips uh go up so quickly as well so this is ford panel did um uh, helped out with sort of creating um uh, a passive house um level uh sip panels Everything's, you know, 3D, it's all numbered, like a 3D jigsaw puzzle, uh, pre-cut, pre-detailed, pre all everything's, you know, 3D uh, computer cut to like one-eighth of an inch or one-sixteenth of an inch. And it was amazing to, to, to sort of see their crew come in um, and put this into, um, into place within four days, I think, all of the wall and roof panel uh, went up. Um, with this, with their own, with their own crane, so really kind of eye-opening to sort of see the power of um, prefabrication on a on a very sort of high-end, high-performance home. Um, I'll just sort of go back a little bit. Uh, so you'll so, you'll see here uh, the openings for all the all the windows. Uh, you can sort of see the opening for the um, for the skylight. Uh, the the end walls um, uh, were also um, but treated a little bit differently. So yeah, you can sort of see here with the basement though, that's that's different, not not tip, that's all sort of concrete clad in, uh, in stone. And then with the um, uh, the interior space, completely open, completely free, um, but the, the the loft floor uh, coming in at a later date, which is separate from the the bent wood frames, which are Douglas fir, um, um, charred and uh, and stained. Um, it's that sort of Stuggy barn uh, effect, um, really beautiful, heavily influenced by Glen Merkett as well as some Japanese, uh, you know, minimalist, um, zen-like uh, design, as well as sort of Northern European, um, uh, Scandinavian designs as well. So really fantastic space, really huge um, uh, height, uh, really generous, pretty, pretty beautiful um, if I, if I say so myself, beautiful space to be in uh, when you're surrounded by nature. You, you can't see any other homes. It's all just uh, woodlands and, um, and sort of uh, rural, uh, rural rolling hills. Um, that's the uh, end of the construction phase, I believe, of the photography. Oh, one more. Um, so this, all this as well. This took a bit of work. So all these windows are, are from. Um, a firm in Austria uh, called Boiso that uh, 475 sort of recommended. Um, I'd never worked with these guys before. Um, all triple glazed uh, sliding patio doors, eight foot by eight foot uh, lift and, and slide, uh, tilt and turn European style uh, windows for the bedrooms. Um, Boiso even did these German design, German engineered um, gas piston um, such dating devices that, that lift up by hand, um, which uh, creates um, you know, hurricane chances, shadows during winter, but also this you know veranda-like experience when they're all open um, across the length of the uh, of the south-facing side of the 
inside of this house. Um, so that took a bit of a bit of work and a bit of detailing and engineering to get to get them right to make them sort of align across this entire um, entire entire house. Um, and then they also did the garage doors of the carriage house. So there was sort of two two parts of this house: the main house, which you you see here, which I'll sort of pause on, and a carriage house, which is a not passive house. So I'm not going to talk about that too much uh, here, but uh, this this is sort of the, the the cheat photo where you can sort of see what we did with um this is actually metal deck roof just a simple standing seam metal deck roof um underneath um the uh sort of decking which happens to be on an angle which happens to be on a roof um it it takes snow load it actually sort of um uh you know one of the reasons why I sort of could convince the client to do this is that we it doesn't shed very it doesn't shed the snow very well during winter so that that snow buildup can can add you know intuitive um uh, value to uh, during winter to keep the heat in um in the house so i i don't really know how much that's you know true but um i'll, I'll refer to bowcraft on on that and the calculations that, that were done on um on on how intuitive uh, all, all of that sort of um worked out to be so yeah, these cross uh, horizontal ebony um, were just basically uh, screwed to these uh, these um, two by four uh, uh, slats, which were then clipped to the uh, to the standing seam. So it's a pretty simple um, uh, uh, detail, but I wasn't aware that it had been done before. Maybe up in Canada, I think there was one, <laughs> and maybe in Kentucky as well. I think there was one other. Um, version. This is, and I forgot to mention, this is, um, I started this in 2016 uh, and it's finished at, towards the end of 2018. Um, oh, so fantastic, not, Ben. It's, it's simple and it's beautiful. We're going to ask you, you we're going to ask you to pause the presentation right there so we get everybody in in the first hour, but we will certainly come back and revisit this because we have a lot of questions for you that came into the chat while you were presenting. Okay. So hold that thought. And with that, I'm going to give it to Sean to introduce our next presenter. Perfect. Thanks, Shannon. So we got Alfred from Euroline. He's a long life, sorry, a lifelong entrepreneur in the construction industry with a wide range of experience in all facets of the building business. He is a certified passive consultant as well as in sales of high quality construction products at Euroline Windows. Can you keep it short, Alfred, so you can jump into things? Give us the presentation. Over to you, bud. Thanks, Sean. And uh, thanks, Ben, for sharing that beautiful house. Man, that is gorgeous. <laughs> um, so just quickly, a couple seconds here about Euroline Windows. You see our, our logo as a sponsor, just to give you some background information about the company. We're a high-performance custom window supplier here in Vancouver since 1993. We make a Tilt and turn windows, that's what really put us on the map. We've been making passive house products since 2016. Uh, we use Rahal Rail Route Depot for our frames uh, with interior foam inserts made of Neopar, and we use Quantic Spacer Bar in our IGUs. Um, we're the first Canadian company to get a certified component window, and um, we are also the first to do a large scale multifamily building here in Vancouver called the Skeena project that we did with Cornerstone Architects. Um, so Euroline supported me in 2021 to get my, to take the course to become a certified passive house consultant. And I supported myself in passing. And um, since then we've really put our foot on the gas to reaffirm our position as the premium Canadian window company, passive house window company, sorry. Um, and by company, I mean not just a supplier, but a partner in all of these projects, because that is key to get these to go as smoothly and as efficiently as possible. So we have multiple single and multifamily projects on the go right now, either in production or in installation phases. And it was difficult to choose one, but uh, I want to talk today about Tomo House because it's a very interesting concept, not just as a passive house, but as, uh, as far as the residents and who's going to live there and how they're going to live there. So Tomo House, sorry, I'll just swap slides here. Tomo House is located on Main Street in Vancouver and Main Street is just that. It's right in the heart of the city. Main goes north, south, and it's a very busy street. 
Um, and since this is definitely a non-typical type of construction for Vancouver, so we're famous for our glass towers with condos in them, which is the most inefficient way to make a multifamily building. This is the opposite. So it's kind of a cool structure as well, sort of a Scandinavian feel. It's 12 units and it's co-housing. It's not a strata, it's actual co-housing. So there's a common space that's shared. There's a common courtyard area and garden, as well as uh, charging for one car that's actually gonna be a shared car and other cars as well and electric bicycles. Um, so you're getting where they're going with this. Um, they're even talking about doing shared meals on barbecue days uh, a couple times a month, which is fantastic. So the reason I wanted to talk about this is because I love this idea of the holistic approach to Passive House. So it's not just a building, but it's a lifestyle. So these people have made a real commitment to the whole, the whole thing. So I feel, and I'm sure a lot of you do too, it's about how we contribute individually. So these people really deserve a hats off. These owners deserve a hats off for their commitment to this. And I mean, it's a, it's a lesson to all of us to sort of live our lives more passively, right? <laughs> um, so why is the window guy at the construction site when they're pouring foundations or stripping foundations? Well, this speaks to the whole process with us and with me. Uh, as Sean mentioned, I'm, I come from a building background. My father was a builder. My whole family's in the construction business. And I take these projects on as though they're my kids. So this is my baby. This is a, a really cool project. And I wanted to be there from the beginning, but there's a lot to be gained from that, right? So I'm interested in the project as a whole and what I can contribute. Maybe I might have some pointers at this stage that could help out. Um, I believe the window supplier in a passive house needs to understand a lot more than just the size, the color and configurations of the windows, or even know how to put that info into the PHPP. You need to understand the relationship with the windows to the whole building as a whole and help to improve that building envelope, especially, and not hinder it. So um, that's where I don't have a lot of technical slides, but to speak to the technical side of this, there's on every every project and especially every passive house project we're going to run into challenges and different different types of challenges so i'd love to give a shout out to the builder on this project Habler group because this is their first passive house like this and um they did a really great job of being involved the top brass was part of the conversations on all of the all of the decisions that need to be made any tweaks that need to be made and it wasn't it was about finding good solutions that would work also, the Passive House consultant for the project was very open to discussion and very helpful. So from the time that we sent the first version of the shop drawings about how these components were going to go together uh, to the final shop drawings, there were lots of talks and there was lots of back and forth. And we had to go from what we all know is the, the difference between an ideal modified window, what you see in our certificate, for example, and the actual configurations and sizes that are going to be on site. So for example, on this job, we provided all of the suite entry doors. So a suite entry door with a full, gla full glass light, so triple glazed doors with a side light. Now, because of the, the size limits of Ralph Epro on length, for example, without creating an issue with maybe warpage for on a door sash, for example, we have to insert a steel connection. So it's a frame to frame connection with a piece of steel in there. So that's a no, no. And that's a no, no for thermal bridging. And it's a no, no for comfort as well. So you could end up with condensation at that spot. It's a, it's a, it's a, a challenge to, to uh, overcome. So we Flixo modeled that. And then with the help of our internal engineering crew and some maybe some ideas from me. We added some uh, foam backer rod in front and in behind that that uh, steel connection, and then siliconed it to death. We reflexoed that, and we were well within the parameters for comfort on that connection. They're not very long; the doors are only 83 inches tall, um, but there are 12 of them, so that adds up. So um, it is a bit of a thermal bridge, but it's an acceptable one that's going to perform in real time. So that's the point of this exercise, like it should. So secondly, we have foam inserts, as I mentioned, those are really highly high efficient foam, it's called Neopore plus, it's got graphite in it. So it really insulates very well. But we have to take some of that foam out at hardware locations and put in intermittent steel. 
So that needs to be factored in. So uh, Roger and I looked at that when we sent in the shops and we reduced the amount of steel to the bare minimum everywhere we could while still maintaining a, a structurally strong window that's not going to change. It's not gonna warp. It's not gonna do anything bad after any time of any number of years. Um, thirdly, as I mentioned, we're on a busy street. Um, so Main Street is four lanes, sometimes up to six lanes of traffic and it's constant. So we had OITC challenges. So with OITC, we're obviously, we're gonna be using thicker glass, six mil lamy in the center pane of the triple glazing. So that actually was a, a bad for a good. It forced us to use an oversized IGU, so a thicker IGU. Um, typically we'd be, we were, our modeled window is 44 mils. We went all the way up to 52 mils. Um, so we have bigger space between the glass and three quarter inch spacer bar. So that led to a better UW or a better center of glass number of 0.65 and an overall UW that was well within, again, the parameters of what we need to do in real time. So all of the, the real guts of the window were really factored in to how it's gonna perform in real life. Um, again, Flixo model, Flixo model, Flixo model. This um, pushed us, forced us to re-look at a lot of our components and provide Flixo models for things like a barrier-free sill for the suite entries, which is a weak link but it has to be there. Um, and we needed that real data so that uh, Roger could model the building correctly. And we were able to do that with them. And then install. Um, we helped with, as I mentioned, Habler, this is their first time building a, a project like this. So they hadn't installed windows in a passive house before. So we helped them out. We didn't do the, the envelope detailing I'm talking about the pure install. So we didn't pick, the, for example, the envelope materials or the weather resistant barriers and things like that. Um, we did provide that, that angle for anchoring the window at the bottom, but they did all of this detailing. But the actual install, we sent our crews over there and we did a, a four hour long mock-up with them, showed them how the windows go in, how they get adjusted and how to get them to work properly. And then lastly, but probably most importantly for a window company in a passive house is to be able to give you an airtight window on top of a thermally efficient window, but an airtight window. So um, aside from just doing the mock-up with them, um, we're actually going back tomorrow. We have an appointment there at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning to do adjustments with them for their blower door test. So they're getting the red door of truth soon and we want them to get a phenomenal number so that they don't have to worry about other elements of the building. So. The windows, although they may be uh, the least insulated part of the wall assembly, they should not be the weakest link in the wall assembly. They should be a great contributor to it. As we know in the pass in a passive house, you can't have a passive house without windows because they're your heat source as well. So we want we want the 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 gist of the exercise was to be a great contributor and to look at what we're doing and be willing to to tweak what we're doing and make it better with our existing systems and make sure that the numbers we're providing are, are accurate and the real-time numbers. So that's that's it. This is a very cool project. I'm very proud to have been a part of it because uh, I, like I say, I love the, the, the full commitment to passive house living on this. And thanks for having me. And I promise to be around more as we are a sponsor here. And I look forward to our component spotlight in September and I promise your minds will be blown. All right, Alfred. Well, that date is pinned. Thank you for that. I know there's a couple of questions, so we'll come back to that. Uh, moving on. Again, it's a great project, and I, and I agree. The co-housing approach um, to development is really unique and really exciting. And so hopefully we'll be able to feature that project as it moves along. So thanks for giving us uh, that little bit of info. Uh, moving along to Kim Walton, happy to introduce her. Kim has worked as a contract building designer since 1980, taking a holistic approach to the design of small buildings. Uh, she facilitates the production of elegant, functional, healthy, durable, energy efficient, beautiful, and fun buildings that are sensitive to the site and client's needs, applying skills in energy modeling and employing excellence in building science, she designs and manages Passive House and Net Zero projects across Western Canada. And Kim is also a certified FIAST designer and builder. And she is our next presenter. Kim. So um, I'm going to talk about a house in Canmore. And thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and the address uh, in Canmore um, is Three Van Horn. Um, 
it's um, my name's Kim Walton, and thank and the as well as uh, the other things that Sean mentioned in the introduction. I'm also a member of the board uh, for Passive House Alberta, and I'm the treasurer for that. And I'm on the board for uh, Passive Buildings Canada, for which I am the president. So just a little plug for those guys. Um, I'm building, working on this project with um, uh, HSS Design Build, which is um, Raphael and um, Collective Carpentry. Uh, we'll be um, supplying the walls and um, and some of the, the floor system and some of the roof system for the project. Um, there's a lot to say about this project, but I'm just going to really focus on the uh, prefabricated um, components of the building. But um, just to say that it is in a cold climate, it's in zone seven, and that um, the walls will be prefabricated. We are also ordering the windows from Europe. so. Um, um, that means that we need to be really prepared for uh, making sure that our rough openings and everything is exactly right for these windows that are coming. And um, a lot of the windows will have window shading and we'll also be get ordering flashing for these windows. So everything needs to be um, pre-planned for. The house will also be electric and, and incorporate low embodied energy and um, fire smart strategies and the stormwater management on the site and it needs to be elk proof if anybody doesn't know what an elk is they're really big deer with antlers and they run in herds in this area um, and it'll be um, certifiable and we intend to certify this project uh, like I say there's a lot to say about it but um, but at this point and this map is just showing us where Canmore is in Canada it's on the east side of the Rocky Mountains and um, all that red stuff on the map um, in the middle is just showing how susceptible the um, area is to wildfire, mostly because of the trees and the forest. The site is astounding anywhere in Canmore. It's quite beautiful. But in this, in this, this particular site, this is the uh, view from um, through the site from the street side to the back of the, of the site of the lot. So it's a valley view with mountains and trees um, and often elk. Um, so the plan of the house, I'm not going to talk about the plan right now um, as much as I am about the components, but the plan incorporates this view. So this is the house. Um, the plan is to have built a box, make it simple for prefabrication. Um, the, um, this, these are the components that will be um, delivered by Collective Carpentry. We, collective, if those that don't know, Collective Carpentry uh, prefabricates walls that are in a class of, classic Larson truss style wall with a, um, a utility wall on the inside and then wall trusses or eye joists on the outside filled with um, cellulose fiber and they arrive on site pre-insulated um, and are craned into place. So Collective Carpentry will supply all of the walls uh, with these rough openings in them, uh, the floor system for the main floor and a drop ceiling for the, um, for the ceiling of the, of the second floor. It's just uh, drawings from Collective Carpentry to show the part, parts that they'll be supplying. So in, um, we're just very, trying to be very simple with what they're supplying and has a bit to do with the economy of, of getting this to the site and um, the prefabrication and um, ease of putting it all together. But this is what the house will look like when we're done. So we'll be adding all of these components um, to the house afterwards, um, adding a garage to the front and all of the um, lipstick, which is functional lipstick, to the rest of the house. And I've got a little video for you, just so that you can see how it all goes together. Um, kind of a slab on grade. Um, site's a little bit too slopey for a complete slab on grade. We're going to put up some walls, throw in a floor system and a drop ceiling, pop a roof on top of all of that, and uh, a deck and a garage. And there we have a kind of a Rocky Mountain house. And with the client dancing in the driveway. Best client, by the way, best client ever. 
so I wanted to show you this um, this page, part of the set of drawings. We've been working on this one literally for months. So um, just because we're really concerned about making sure we've got the right rough openings and the right windows and the right sizes, we've got metric dimensions in here and we've got imperial dimensions in here and we've got rough openings detailed in here and um, we're specifying which which windows have blinds which windows do not um, patio some patio doors or have um, a bigger sill and some are smaller the, some of the window frames change so all of those things are so important to detail and be sure that we have accurate done accurately before we order them and so that we have no surprises on site And with all of that is a ton of details for the installation of all these doors and windows so that we all understand where uh, the windows and doors are in the walls because that changes from window to window. The lintels are changing from window to window and door to door. And some of the, um, because some of the windows have blinds and some don't, um, those details all change as well. So it looks pretty simple, um, but there's a lot of pre-planning involved. Um, this is uh, just more window details um, that have to do with the installation of, of, of uh, how these windows will be installed, whether they have blinds and what the sills look like, just because they're all, all these components will be pre-ordered. And that is my presentation, which I think is five minutes. <laughs> Kim, that was amazing. Such I have time. so many more things to present about this house, but that's just a teaser. Well, it is. This is why this whole thing is about is to get people to come back in the fall to uh, check out the full stuff. This is fantastic. I, and lots of great uh, points about that project. So now we're going to move along to Brandon. Brandon is a passive house and development consultant at NK Passive. He's an accredited architecture and real estate professional and is actively involved in the design and development of high performance, zero energy buildings, advocating for policy advancement that leads to sustainable urban environments and more attractive neighborhoods. And I have to also say, since this is actually the fifth anniversary of the Icebox Challenge that started in Vancouver, he was a very integral part of getting the Icebox moved into the US. He did have to spend, I think, a dollar US to make the transition it happen. It was a dollar US, not Canadian. Yep. You are correct. And, uh, and you had to put something on the uh, bill of sale. And I uh, was able to carry on. So Brandon, over to you. And thanks again for all the, the Icebox Challenge stuff. So yeah. over to you. Uh, absolutely. Well, thanks for uh, the introduction. I will say I'm a last minute fill-in for uh, the owner and the developer himself. Um, I will say what I love about this owner, and Kim, I'll have to challenge you on the best owner ever. He actually shows up at uh, Passive House Accelerator, which I think he's one of the few owners and developers who uh, are perfectly willing to be here. Uh, so that said, uh, Shane and I have worked together probably four or five years at this point. We're now doing a whole series of projects together. This was the first one we worked on. Unfortunately, in Montgomery County, where this is located, it can take seven years from when you start something to when people move in. So we're four years in, which gives you a rough idea of where we're at and about three years left to go. Um, make sure you're seeing my screen. I'm assuming you're seeing my screen. Looks great. There we go. Just making sure it advances. Is everybody seeing it okay? Good. Yeah, so Shane Pollard, uh, truly the best partner I could ever ask for. He is a third generation developer. His partner is his cousin. Two development families intermarried. Um, a very interesting way to get it. There are families who have been investing in real estate since the very, uh, I guess, the end of World War II and uh, early 1950s. They're trying to figure out how to get it on to the next generations. And that is really key to kind of where they came from. So the Duffy Companies is Jeremy Duffy. The PS Ventures is Shane Pollan. They're in partnership with the Housing Opportunity Commission of Montgomery County, which is the large quasi-governmental agency charged at uh, providing affordable and mixed-use housing. Uh, housing Opportunity Commission of Montgomery County is in the same boat. They did a lot of development in the 50s and 60s, getting garden-style apartments near metro stops in the D.C. area. That stuff is now 50 years old. 
needs to be replaced. The locations where their housing has located um, is just ready for that next version. So what they're often doing is taking uh, two or three story uh, existing low income multifamily housing in high transit, high density areas and converting it into high performance uh, towers going forward. Uh, they've got a large backlog that they're planning. So what I'm going through tonight is the first of what will hopefully be a series. This was also planned as like the prototype project to prove that they could do it at scale at close to cost. Um, how Duffy got here, I think the best quote that Shane would give that I've heard him give again and again, they hold and operate everything they own. And so they're not concerned about who they need to rent to today. They're concerned about who they have to compete to 20 years from now. And that perspective, that shift on the ownership side really drives what they do. And the, one of the better stories they said was very early on, just after like 2002, 2003, they needed a new family office building. Uh, Shane and his cousin decided to go early and deep into lead. The goal was they were going to build an office building, go for like lead gold. They'll take 20% of it, and then they'll take it to market for 80%. They built that building, which was their headquarters. GSA came along, kicked them out, took over the building, took an entire lease, said they couldn't have it. And then eventually they had to go on and find their own headquarters later. But what they realized very early on is they committed to doing green building, ultra energy efficient building the market perpetually was rewarding. And that feedback loop on an ownership side has really convinced them to be at the forefront and to keep pushing, pushing energy, pushing other aspects of green building because they're always coming back for it. They're the first owner that I'll say, will like put a slide like this up. This is a PS Venture slide. I mean, in some degree, we've all seen some variant of it, but this is truly how sustainability comes to the core of what they do. And also, once again, this is Shane's slide, the owner putting forward, why are they focusing on durability, energy costs, surpassing code compliance. Um, they will use incentives to help fund it. They are perfectly willing to go out and chase money to help cover that cost delta. But it also ties into even their family identity, and their family properties, meaning people seek them out for it. And this property that they came up, the one that we're talking about today, Hillendale well, Gateway, it came about because they were involved in a master planning process and their family owned everything, most everything on one side of the neighborhood. The Housing Opportunity Commission owned a uh, low rise existing building on the other side. And when it went out to RFP, it became very natural. Like um, their interests were aligned. They're not a market rate developer who's going to go out and flip it and then go try to do something else. They will stay in it for the long term. Um, they actually do care about the developer that they're doing. it. It's right across the street from a large uh, asset that they have. So they want to make sure that good quality housing goes in. And they have taken properties that they have and are slowly taking what are parking lots and then filling them with hotels, multi-story offices, and redevelopment. This is right at the Capitol Beltway, right where 95 comes in. So it's an incredibly prominent area. So the project itself uh, is in multiple phases. It will be an all-electric, mixed-use, mixed-income development. There are, uh, we'll call it the AR portion, is the left hand that is age-restricted with retail on the bottom. There's a eight story precast garage wrapped in solar panels in the middle. Um, I will say, I always have to double check this. There's 1.3 gigawatts of on site solar generation, which equates somewhere to about four and a half to five acres of on site solar. Then there's a 308 unit market rate mixed income building. Um, I will say it also has a swimming pool in the envelope for those who really want to geek out on the tech side. That is an incredibly fun thing to model. Um, there is a pad in the middle that's going to have some interim retail around a gathering space, but it's also planned that it can take a seven-story office building, prepped as heavy timber, or a heavy timber hotel, depending on which way the market goes. So that FAR is held in reserve. Uh, there is also a famous international coffee shop that wanted to switch sides of the intersection. And you can probably figure out which one that is by the drive through there. Um, 
I think too, another key part is they do use passive house as a way to hit lead platinum as a way to get to a uh, deep tax incentive. So they are capitalist market rate uh, developers, just like anybody else. The good news is that they're just, their heart's in the right place and they're willing to chase after the incentives. So they're using the solar tax credit. They're using light tech. They're using uh, tax abatement in order to help get this stuff done to scale. Um, flip back through. So that's kind of a good idea of the overall site. We do have a bit on approach. This once again is from them. Um, the way that I met Shane was uh, he researched us six months before he ever even introduced himself. He researched Passive House before he ever introduced himself. I was at the time spending about half my time in Seattle, half here. He went to Seattle, saw us at the FIAS conference, and then approached us. And it was because of alignment. He was trying to find people who could really help him do it at scale. And then he built a diverse team of professionals from around the country, trying to find the best that he could with electrification, mechanical, uh, GC, everything. And then fully believes in iteration. So all team members are on all calls. Everybody's working towards the same goal. And anything that we might decide, even if we've made a decision as a team, if something comes up later as more information that might alter a system, we'll collectively put forward the issues, put forward uh, the alternatives, analyze it at a group, kick the tires as a group, and then make a collective decision as where to go. Uh, the simple, keep it as simple as possible, absolutely. Um, the best sample of that is, you know, we had VRF in it originally, didn't like the price. We ended up at one-to-one -one air source heat pump, Mitsubishi pump to get the units, the simplest uh, possible. You would normally never expect it to work on a large building. Well, the group realized that well, all, what was the restriction? It was the run length. Okay, well, how do you deal with the run length? Well, let's get that condenser near the unit. Where can we put it near the unit? On a deck. Great, can we come up with a prefab deck that has two condensers and it's stacked on top so one deck can serve as two units and have under 60 feet of line? And we ended up reducing the overall volume of refrigerant we needed because we were able to actually come up with a different way of doing things. And really key is the value cost analysis, the fact that they do not look at first cost, they look at ultimate cost. And they analyze that there, perform an open, so we can actually see it. And then the team, uh, I will say I hit the strange role of design architect, passive house consultant, and development consultant. There's not a role for that. I don't even know what hat I have, but it goes through procurement. I'm in multiple parts of the team, but I have a great partner in Torty Gallus, which is a local partner for architect of record who I'm essentially training from the inside. And then you can see everybody else. I mean, I have to give a shout out to Redwood Energy in uh, California. Those who don't know Sean Armstrong, I keep trying to get him on this. The argument is that he talks too much, that he probably shouldn't be on the Passive House Accelerator. But he has by far been the best uh, assistance in terms of electrification. Uh, just a wealth of knowledge of what's coming. And we needed that. Like there's something as much as in our community, we kind of know what's happening with appliances or hot water heaters or whatever. But to have somebody who that's what he's thinking about every day as part of the team, he was really able to say what was coming. And uh, McGrand too on the mechanical side and electrical side was really key. Two seconds. And it's gonna flip through just the last couple. Uh, the decisions we made, easy enough, I could go into details on any one of those later. I mean, I know it's the tech side, but you can see we often went for just the simplest thing possible, but the best, most durable decision possible. And we worked through each line item and each thing that we needed to pay attention to an electrification of passive house and we solved it. And then now the county has dived deep because this first development showed that it was possible. They're now moving towards trying to get all their buildings to pay attention to uh, essentially reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, but doing it through ultra energy efficient buildings. They're laying out an incredibly uh, aggressive climate plan to get there. And they've been really supportive, um, I will say. Even on the review, I was terrified by using WUFI as energy code compliance. We did a pre review with a reviewer. We were the only one that made it through at one stop. He took a look at the two WUFI models and we were out the back door. Kind of blew my mind. 
and just some last kind of, uh, you know, we're getting better images as we go. Um, I think the inclusion of pickleball, you know, that was a funny one that the owner, we had a little bit of space and we threw it in facing the beltway. Uh, to get an idea of the solar, you could get about the feeling of how much of those roofs are covered. Um, we're finally getting into real renderings of the inside of the space. So it's coming along. Um, right now we're in earthwork. So we've got the building permit and land use entitlement, which is why we're finally willing to talk about the project. It's been alluded to for years, but in Montgomery County, anybody can come along and throw a wrench in the entitlement and cause a lot of delay. Um, in the middle of it, we ended up having to build a transit center as part of it, which was not part of the original project. Um, but right now, demolition is underway. The existing building is gone. We've got about four months of earthwork. Uh, we've got Clark Builders Group, uh, one of the largest uh, East Coast uh, general contractors on board. We're frantically trying to get them up to speed on Passive House because they were not who we did pre-construction on. They wanted through uh, procurement and low bid. So, you know, we're not there yet. We've got three more years of battles, but the good news is we've kind of made it through to the point where, you know, it's entitled, it's there, it's ready to go. It's got mission approval. So it's moving forward to, uh, you know, actual construction and the same kind of partnership, including one more, also has started the next three towers behind it. Um, that contract just got awarded I actually had to go through the procurement process again because it's public, but uh, the next three are now in line. So we've got about 875 units coming behind this um, using the same philosophy. And I think about the only change we're looking at making is paying attention to the body carbon. So we're actually looking at doing those in heavy timber on top of everything. That's it.